to Leslie be Rode with Martin Twain Trust, and I'm joined today in full color uh, with the other three members of the trust here. And so, um, starting at the, I think it's the left of your screen. I can never keep that, you know, straight as to who's left and who's right here. But uh, you know, so Corey Burke, you know, sporting a dark shirt. <laughs> Close. He's wearing clothes. Yeah, because he was wearing clothes. That's that's good. That's the reason we let him on today. And then Dan, uh, who's actually strangely not in black and white. Um, Corey was thinking he was going to fit in with Dan on that. With I'm going to drop down to black and white in a minute. Okay, which will but at least people know that you've got purple headphones, which is the important thing to match the ever co colorful Michelle Chan's Sangthong, who's it's in a little bit brighter shade of purple today. And so today I believe we're talking about real Facebook case studies of making money using Facebook, and we're studying that. Woohoo! I think I got that more or less right, Dan. Yeah, I'm on the case. Okay, good. <laughs> You're on the case. You are a case. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so Dan, if we'd like to, you know, are you ready for your presentation, or do you have any preliminary comments for the audience before? Oh, yeah, one preliminary comment. So for those of you who have been, <clears throat> following the saga of, uh, of Hangouts. Um, apparently every 52 weeks, give or take, actually it turns out to be 50 weeks, because the way I set it up originally, the link to, the hangout, to our Hangout will change, and that happened today. So those of you probably got an email that are on here must have gotten the email from Stephanie that said, emergency, Hangout link has changed. Sorry about that. We had no idea that it was going to change. Um, and it did, and we'll we'll research that next week to figure out when it change if ever it has to change again or how to fix that. But anyway, as it is, uh, if if some of you didn't get on, you know, online until late because you had to like get the updated link, apologize for that. Unknown to us in advance. So, uh, Dan, are you ready to become presenter and and bring up your slides? I am ready for my solo. All right, here we go. Presenting to everyone. Hi, everyone. <laughs> he's, he's actually online, too. I'm Dan, and I am presenting to you, and I'm going to drop down to black and white now to improve the amount of bandwidth that I have available. Yes. To uh, reach you with my presentation. Right. And I'm going to do the screen share thing here and do it this way because it's the only way that we can trust it, even though it turns into the Hall of Mirrors thing. Yep. And then wham, my pop up preview so that we can look at that instead. Can anybody see it yet? Yes, it looks great. We're Fantastic. Yeah. I will make that full screen. That's even better. Now we don't see all the, the hundreds of applications you think need to be in the ribbon bar. But. So I uh, got volunteered last week to present a couple of Facebook advertising case studies, and so I had to pick a couple, um, and I, there were, well, gosh, several more that I had to leave out. And so what I'm going to try and do at the end is, is just briefly touch on some of the areas that uh, maybe I won't get to in these two case studies, because it's, it's uh, one of the interesting things about the... Uh, the Facebook advertising world and about the, the uh, kind of the approach that we take, the universal traffic engine approach to how we tie all the channels together is that uh, the campaigns end up being a lot like snowflakes and so no two are alike and it's really a matter of fitting together the different pieces and parts that you have uh, to come up with a package that lets you deliver the right message to the right people to get the response that you want because that's really all we're trying to do. And so we're going to start out with one that uh, we probably haven't talked about in a while, uh, but it's a very interesting case study to me from a Facebook perspective because it's a lot closer to, uh, well, where a lot of folks uh, who don't have, say, customer lists and things like that end up starting, which is you're almost starting cold. <coughs> and so uh, this was uh, one that we worked on uh, last summer, I believe, Michelle, um, with uh, Karen Smith from Canine Approved Groomers. And what they do is they help employers find professional groomers. Um, they also help groomers find employers because that's uh, the other side of uh, a jobs board, isn't it? 
and uh, they also do some work in educating people uh, to become professional groomers. So maybe to move from hobbyist to a professional and to improve uh, their career as a professional. And they had been traveling around doing trade shows uh, to try and uh, drum up interest. And uh, of course, there's one group that's at the trade shows and uh, they're not necessarily the group that you want. And so that's one thing, but the people that you do find at the trade shows that are what you want are actually very interesting, and so they were able to leverage that. But uh, the trade shows were getting, uh, well, uh, not great results, but results that were certainly acceptable for the business. Their first trade show that was one that they did in Chicago, and they ended up literally spending, it was actually, if you account for everything, far more than $50 per lead. But the most optimistic scenario where they pretend they would have been at the trade show anyway, they... they, they um, uh, spent about fifty dollars per lead, and uh, it's not so good to get people signed up and registered as groomers. Uh, they did another show in Pennsylvania that got it down to about ten dollars per lead. They did some more stuff right there. It was probably a better show for them in terms of the audience. And they did another one in Wisconsin, so they were getting to about ten dollars per lead from these trade shows. And they had tried Facebook before, but it really, really, really hadn't done that well. It wasn't even a question of cost per lead. It was the fact that it was cost without leads. And the first thing that we found out when we started talking about this was how just uh, poorly they had targeted uh, the audience before. They did very broad targeting, and they went after, well, basically too many people. There are really four ways to target on Facebook. So you can use interest-based targeting. And so you can say... I want people who are interested in tennis or uh, Nike shoes or fashion or um, heavy metal rock, whatever the interest your audience might uh, might have that you might go after. And then you can filter that down a little bit by demographics. So you can say, I only want to target males between 30 and 55 or whatever. And there are also behavioral categories, which are a, a very rich and um, slightly more pricey way, uh, source of data when you go out and buy it in the wild um, for your own audience, but when you go and buy this data through Facebook advertising, well, you're just renting the data to target your ads, and it doesn't really cost you any more to use it, but uh, it's uh, considerably more effective when you use behavioral categories to filter down the, the list that you're targeting, but all, not all interests are equal in strength in terms of, uh, you know, somebody might say that they're interested in this, and, well, that, that's something that Facebook interpreted from some action that they took, so I'm pretty sure someone uh, in, in the bowels of Facebook has programmed their computer to think that I'm interested in what Donald Trump has to say. Um, that's just because I've been on Facebook and you can't avoid this stuff. I'm probably not uh, not interested in that at all, but if you wanted to target me on Facebook, that's one of the things that uh, that they would think I'm interested in. Custom audiences are another way to go, and there's a couple of different ways to do this, uh, but the way that is available to most of us most of the time is to upload uh, either email addresses or phone numbers from customers or prospects. Now, these are supposed to be people that you actually have some kind of a relationship with. So, you know, if they've opted in to get emails from you, if they're a customer, that's one thing, but you can't just go out and buy people's email addresses. And speaking of spammy things that Facebook doesn't want you to do, you can also upload actual lists of Facebook user ID numbers. Now, um, a lot of people have done this in the past and gotten themselves kicked off of Facebook for scraping pages and groups and, and grabbing the user IDs of people that are uh, interacting on them. Uh, but now user ID upload is only permitted on Facebook advertising for registered application developers. So all these tools that you've found on the Warrior Farm to scrape the audience off and target it, one, uh, that was never a, an especially effective way to do it compared to just doing it the right way. And two, uh, well, you can't do it anyway. And uh, again, yeah, Facebook will kick you right off. You can also use from a custom audience that you've created a lookalike audience. And uh, this can be very narrowly defined and very broadly defined. But what this does is Facebook tries to match up characteristics of other people on Facebook who aren't in your custom audience. So if you've uploaded your customer email list, Facebook will try and find people who are similar to them in, uh, well, interests, demographics, and the other stuff that Facebook has access to in terms of people's data. This uh, can be, I said uh, before, narrow to broad. So uh, the most narrowly defined, the one that is most similar to your customers, is what we call a 1% look-alike audience, and uh, the one that has uh, the most broadly defined shred of a relationship to the, to the audience that you've uploaded 
is what we call a 100% look-alike audience, and we pretty much never use the 100% look-alike audience, and uh, we uh, always start our campaigns to look-alike audiences with a 1% audience. And then, uh, and then, of course, you can also use remarketing. So you can put pixels on your website, and you can build a cust uh, website custom audience, and you can do that uh, with uh, Facebook's new pixel based on all kinds of fantastic things, like did they visit a particular page? Did they visit um, any of a certain set of pages? Did they visit a certain number of pages? Did they watch a video? Uh, pretty much the sky's the limit in terms of what you can do um, in terms of triggering that pixel and putting people into a custom audience based on what they did on your website. And that's a very, very useful thing uh, that actually leads us to the ability to do dy some dynamic advertising too, where people say if you're a retailer, if they have viewed a product, you can actually show them ads for that product. The big problem with using interests is that Facebook uh, is, well, very, it's very, very hard to, to determine exactly how Facebook decides what people are interested in. So it's a good starting point. It's better than nothing, but you also have to be aware that it is not precision targeting. One of the things that you can do with, uh, with Facebook uh, anytime you're seeing a sponsored post is you can actually go, there's a little drop-down menu at the top right, uh, and you can go into that menu and ask Facebook, well, why am I seeing this ad? In the case of this ad from the million-dollar coach, he totally looks like a million-dollar coach, too. I totally trust that. Um, is that um, the million dollar coach um, wanted to reach people who had visited their website or used one of their apps and this is based on customer and so this is an upload okay and so um, in this case probably somebody that scraped user IDs out of a group that I was in and well, hadn't been kicked off of Facebook yet at the time that I saw this ad but whatever this says in here it really doesn't matter what you can do is go to this ad preferences thing and actually see what interests you have that um, are there. So here's some of the stuff that Facebook thought I was interested in. Coffee? Oh yeah. Yes, I'm very interested in coffee. Cooking? Not so much. Eating? Sure. Food? Yes. Japanese cuisine? Okay, I guess. I mean, sushi? Oh yes, they got that one. Restaurants? Mm, not really interested in restaurants. And onion? Well, uh, that's probably because I do read The Onion, but you'll see in all of these different categories an immense number of interests if you've spent any time on Facebook at all. And when you start to look at how actually really well targeted some of these are for you, you'll understand that it's the same for everybody else. Uh, certainly some fantastic uh, music suggestions for me. Um, disco? Um, probably not. Funk? Maybe. But Facebook has uh, details here, and you should, if you haven't done this before, actually go in and look at what your interests look like to Facebook, because that's why we really can't just use interest-based targeting. So uh, for Karen, we were trying to find pet groomers, and so pet grooming is an interest that's a possibility, but of course not everybody that's interested in pet grooming is a groomer. In fact, well, if you ever liked a picture of a pet that had been groomed, you're probably interested in pet grooming, according to Facebook. Uh, and, uh, of course, if you've liked lots of dog pictures in particular on Facebook, pet grooming is very likely to be an interest because a lot of those pictures are pumped out there by groomers as part of their content marketing campaigns and stuff like that. So um, every now and then one of them is going to hit a home run uh, with that kind of content marketing like Leslie talked about last week and so every now and then you're going to end up being interested in pet grooming but eh, well, maybe not all that interested. So you have to layer some other stuff in there and, and of course we also did layer quite a bit of other stuff in there, things like demographics and, and, uh, and stuff like that. But Karen also had another option to add to the mix, which is she had about 400 people that they registered, if you remember, paying anywhere from $50 uh, or more uh, in their first trade show to more around $10 or $11 in subsequent trade shows. Um, and she had that custom audience that she could upload, and, and so she could create a custom audience, then create a lookalike audience, and then layer pet grooming on top of that as, as an interest. And now you're much, much more likely to be hitting the bullseye. Uh, in terms of reaching groomers. So targeting at best though really just gets you to the suspects. So people that are potentially interested but they're not really prospects. That is to say we don't really know that they have any interest in what we're doing just that they're vaguely more likely than other people in the world to be 
uh, to be interested in. And so what we have to do in our campaigns when we're targeting by interest and targeting at the very wide end of the funnel is we have to use what we call qualifying offers or qualifying content. And that's something uh, basically that if they clicked to read that article or if they clicked to sign up for a promotion or a contest or something like that, that indicates that they're probably, well, the kind of person that we really want to talk to. So the keys to qualifying offers are one, and this is very important, you want something that is unlikely to appeal to non-prospects. Okay, so something that the people that aren't part of the group that you want are, well, just not very likely to take your offer and very likely to appeal to qualified prospects regardless of, uh, um, you know, kind of the state that they might be in. Most of the time you're just trying to get closer to the center of the bullseye with your qualifying offers. And again, the same thing with qualifying content. So if they actually took the time to go click and read this article, they're much more likely to be a prospect for your business than, uh, than, than not. And so you might take people who are, say, interested in AdWords and then say, well, here's a story about how retailers can improve their ad, AdWords ROI. When someone clicks that article, it's much more likely than that that individual is a retailer, and I'd probably want to be running ads at them down the road for running things like shopping campaigns as opposed to um, uh, other types of advertising that we might show to them. And then you can use remarketing, so you can take people that clicked to, click to the first thing, and then you can make them an offer. So you can use qualifying content followed by a qualifying offer, or you can use qualifying offers followed by multiple pieces of qualifying content in a sequence to identify people that are actually prospects. And those are the people that you're going to actually invest heavily in developing a relationship with. Now, I'm, I must be missing a slide here. I'm definitely missing a slide here because what we were able to do with the campaign uh, for for Karen was get her down to um, $1.80 a lead and get literally hundreds more leads than they had gotten from <clears throat> from uh, their trade show campaigns. And this was over the course of a few weeks. I think they spent uh, uh, something like uh, $60 the first week, Michelle, and we had... <laughs> more than 100, 100 leads the, the very first week out. And the offer that they made was very simple. And I, I, what's missing here is the picture of the offer, which ties all together. And the offer that they made was for um, a free set that you could win a set of grooming shears, which is a, a, a very high-end set of scissors that only uh, somebody who's really into grooming would, would want to get because, well, uh, they're just not that, uh, that worthwhile. And so to qualify the, for the contest, you actually had to register and fill out a profile as a professional groomer. So it was something that, one, brought people in as a, as a highly, uh, highly qualified audience. So the people that came uh, to that offer page were actually good for remarketing. But also the people that, uh, that signed up, of course, then you already know now that you're dealing with somebody who's a professional groomer because they filled out a, a professional grooming profile. So, gosh, that, that slide is just missing. We'll have to figure out how to fix that later on. Our next case study, um, and I guess uh, Leslie or Michelle or anybody, if you're watching the chat, if we had any questions about that, we could probably pick off a couple of them here and now before we move on to the next one. This is a case study of an online retailer. And this is the kind of thing that um, well, you'll always hear is really hard to sell uh, through Facebook, but in fact, it's one of the easier types of things to sell, which is this is a very high-end product, which is going to be of interest to a relatively small segment of the of the the marketplace for cosmetics overall. Um, Kenny says he's baking a ham. I'm not sure what that means, but it's obviously not a question. Um, <laughs> yeah, we we no, but. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a sin in at least one or two religions, so I would just consult with your uh, pastor or other spiritual advisor to make sure yeah, you can eat that ham. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's uh, uh, because of the change in, in link today, you know, I, I'm, I'm suspicious that we're having a little bit lower attendance than we would normally would, but so far we don't have any questions. But by all means, folks, uh, for those of you who didn't make the live, um, the live event, uh, whatever your whatever your market is, and whatever your your uh, your questions are about targeting on Facebook are, uh, now is the time to get those answered live. So just you know, put those in the chat, 
And uh, Dan, I think probably you should go ahead and continue with your next case study. Okay, so this is one of those businesses that um, sometimes we just completely randomly meet. And, uh, and, and Paul is, uh, is, is one of those folks that um, it was just blind luck that he ended up in uh, our universal traffic engine training. Um, and uh, he was actually getting ready to bail out um, uh, before the first session because he had already spent some money advertising on Facebook and had just basically burned through it all uh, with well, no success whatsoever. And uh, But uh, something uh, talked him into asking a question on, uh, on our first class session and uh, we gave him a little bit of a shred of direction and he was able to put together a really remarkable set of campaigns in very short order uh, based on uh, simply knowing the customer. And uh, Gaia Organic sells uh, premium organic skin care products. So that's uh, stuff that you stick on your face. Uh, so they've got an anti-aging cream, anti-wrinkle, probably stuff to moisturize. And uh, I don't know, I don't uh, really use that stuff. It's, those of you who have met me in person would probably say, Dan, you should use more skin care products. But I don't. But uh, they're, they're dealing with a high-end product. And it's, uh, again, you know, the, the, the time we started working with them last summer, uh, they were you know, very small, just getting started, uh, but um, certainly had some big ideas. And they've got a really good brand story. So Gael is actually a person um, who is uh, 68 years old, or at least that's what they claim and seem to have proof to back up. But you really would not believe that if you saw her in person in the images that they have to to show on the website and their social marketing are just absolutely amazing. Um, and this is the stuff that she's been using, her mother's recipes, or I'm not sure exactly what the story is there. You could read it on the website. But uh, so one thing is you've, you've got a really good spokes model who says this is the stuff that I use to stay young looking. And uh, oh, by the way, they actually look young. And the other side of the, the, the brand story, which is a little bit interesting and has a little bit of an angle to it, we didn't. Uh, get too far in focusing on it, but most U.S. cosmetic products can't actually be sold in the EU as organic because, well, they're not organic enough uh, to, to meet the EU standard for organic products. So there's a lot of stuff that you might be able to buy in the United States that, that has an organic label on it, but, um, well, for whatever reason, and I, I, I haven't done enough research on whether it makes sense or not, but <laughs> those products won't meet the, the, the European standard for calling itself an organic product. And so this is one of the few that actually does. And they had been doing some selling. They've been doing some selling on Amazon. They've been doing some selling online and, and mostly getting business by referral. But they did have a customer database of about 400 buyers to start with. And that's actually pretty good. It's a little bit on the low end of what we'd like to have. But uh, when you've got something like uh, like their products, I, I think that's the kind of thing where it's very niche kind of lends itself better to, uh, to being able to target with a custom audience based on, on your customer database because there, there are going to be things that are, that are in common that really jump out. Uh, whereas, you know, if you just sell, um, you know, lawnmowers or something like that uh, and, you know, everybody in the suburbs has to buy a lawnmower, then your, your custom audience isn't going to be all that specific unless you have something very specific about your lawnmower um, <clears throat> that, that causes uh, people to identify themselves like maybe it's a NASCAR rider mower um, with uh, a souped up engine that can go 200 miles an hour across the lawn or something like that and that only appeals to a certain kind of person. So Paul's targeting plan that we came up with was pretty simple. It was, hey, hey, man, upload that customer list to Facebook and, and see what you can do. Well, so when you upload a list of customer emails to Facebook, you don't find that every email address that you have in your records matches the one that they signed up for Facebook with. And so in this case, the 400 became about 260, which is actually pretty good, which indicates that there are a lot of their customers that are either giving them, quote, their real email address or that, well, only have one email address that they use for everything. And uh, that's uh, something that we found in um, actually more than a few high-end audiences uh, where their luxury goods and things like that, where, where uh, people really just, they only have the one email address. Um, so, uh, 
kind of like my mom, just has the one email address, has had it forever, and uh, you know, it's at Hotmail, so that's the way it is. Um, and so what we did there was we created a lookalike audience, and, and we created what we call the 1% lookalike audience. That's the most narrow type of lookalike, and still, even with that, 260 contacts exploded to 1.2 million people. And again, this can happen with a small audience if they had had um, you know, 2,000 customer records and we'd had you know, 1,200 uh, matching uh, records, that probably would have been only slightly more than that 1.2 million with that narrow, narrow audience. Well, we added some interest targeting onto it, and uh, that's stuff that we're not going to tell you what interest they targeted. Um, and that got our list down to 50,000, and then we added premium credit cards as a starting point because, well, there's no preset spending that went on those suckers, and when you're yeah, getting ready to ask someone to spend a few hundred bucks on skincare products, it's uh, it's a good uh, category to be able to add. And by the way, when you're testing and trying to get your targeting right, because that's the first thing that you want to do if you're going to run ads on Facebook, is make sure that you do everything that you can to get your targeting right. So even if you're targeting people who have already been your customers, you might still want to uh, filter that down by gender and demographics to make sure that you're actually uh, targeting people that are most likely to respond and get that right before you expand. Uh, and so somewhere, you know, 10, 15,000 is actually a pretty good audience size to be able to test. I'm happy to test with a smaller audience, uh, but as the audience gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it starts to look less like precision testing and more like just uh, you know, throwing uh, a hand grenade into the lake and hoping you'll hit a fish. So the ad I love and the offer is, um, well, it's so great because it's not even an offer. So they already had this line art. They had a bunch of line art that they had had drawn of all the different ingredients. This is uh, some kind of uh, alpine herb from the Swiss Alps called Edelweiss. Uh, I think I got that right. Um, and uh, so they have this beautiful piece of art. It's very, uh, you know, the, all of the artwork and the design, everything like that is very high-end brandy. And uh, honestly, if you're not doing a high-end brand, just don't don't even try and do this kind of weird low contrast stuff. I don't get why they do it, but it's what people expect to see, and so I guess that's why they do it. The copy had already been written. This is just part of what was on the product description um, on the product page, which is, by the way, a landing page that they already had. So there's literally uh, no new artwork uh, needing to be created. Now, you might ask me, hey, how did they get past the 20% filter? <laughs> Luck. Um, but uh, but that's one of the things that, that can sometimes happen with these uh, low, super low, low contrasty stuff um, is that you can end up with uh, with something that uh, well, that wouldn't pass muster, passing muster. By the way, you can also bypass that same filter by using uh, uh, retargeting uh, campaigns if you're just using an existing audience through things like perfect audience or ad roll. Uh, where Facebook doesn't vet the ads that, that go through that, and so you can at least get stuff onto the right-hand rail. But let me just read you the ad. Edelweiss thrives in the high alps where the sun's rays are most intense. It contains antioxidants that are more powerful than vitamin C, yet it soothes delicate skin, <laughs> making Edelweiss extract particularly valuable in anti-aging creams for dry-sensitive skin, like ultra-sensitive cream. So they've just taken you from the high alps to... <laughs> buy our skincare product in one, two sentences there, but it's not even a hundred words. It's absolutely beautifully written copy, and it gets right to the point. And, well, gosh, I'm in the target audience. I'm rich. I'm getting older. I want anti-aging and antioxidant stuff. This looks cool. I don't have anything else to do. I'm going to take a look at it. Click and cha-ching. And so actually this is, a, this is a slide from the very, very early results, the very, very first campaign, the very, very first few days. Um, they spent $100 and had $850 in directly track revenue. It was actually more like $1,300 if you look at people that uh, clicked the Facebook ad and came back later and bought, but we can't prove that they wouldn't have come back and bought anyway and they just happened to see the Facebook ad and click on it and that's just a coincidence because of course some of these people were already customers, but in total, um, the audiences that they were that they were targeting included 
customers, that's uh, 260 people. Website visitors, that's another 200 that they got from uh, remarketing people that came through um, one of these campaigns. They had 900 fans on their Facebook page, and um, and some of those actually came in over the course of this campaign, and a couple hundred of them, I think. And then they actually had the lookalike audience. The lookalike audience out of all of these actually generated more sales. And when you see that happen, that is a case of really, really, really hitting the center of the bullseye with your targeting. And, well, we had everything going for us here um, in, in this case. We had a customer database that we could upload to start with. We had some characteristics, some interests about the audience that we could lay out layer on. And we had the, not just this will narrow it down, but these people are very likely to be good candidates, the behavioral filter of premium credit cards that we could all uh, load into our Facebook advertising. But the funny thing here is we spent $93 uh, and we got 30 clicks. And so what's that, about three bucks a click? Some of you people wouldn't even bid that on AdWords for a search result page. But they got seven sales out of that direct, uh, directly out of those clicks and $850 in revenue. The cool thing is the organic echo that we got out of this, uh, which I'll explain kind of what that means in a second here, it generated a few more sales as well. Uh, but here's the landing page. I mean, it is, um, to me, just an absolute abomination of clean design. The low contrast that you see on your screen is exactly how low and poor contrast the page is. The type is tiny. You have to squint to read it. Maybe they're, they want to make people read. Uh, Paul and I had a couple of conversations about this where he just said, I don't understand rich, uh, rich people or I don't understand uh, luxury goods or I don't understand the fashion or, or cosmetics market. And I plead guilty to all of those. But uh, I do see the little logo here that says Eco Certified Organic Co Cosmetic. And are we selling this to old people who can't read little tiny text? Um, I, I, I think most of us that buy this kind of stuff are not in their 70s, Leslie, because at that point, it's too late. Um, but people that are in their 40s, late 30s, stuff like that is when you kind of start to come into the market to buy lots of skin goo. Uh, okay. Because I can't read this. And, I'm to, and, of course, you know, if you came into the money younger, then you probably have been buying the skin goo all along. Mm. Fair point. Because uh, <laughs> once you've got disposable income that you can just throw at stuff because you feel like it, well, you become a perfect customer for this kind of stuff. Mm. Um, but the funny thing here is uh, one of the things that, that I thought was cool about this one, and, I, and this is something that we, we called this out um, early on um, in the, the first session on the very first day of Universal Traffic Engine, was um, page post engagement might actually be the right kind of campaign to run rather than a website click or a website conversion campaign. And so the one that everybody would have told us to use would be website conversions, right, because that's the objective that we want. Um, and don't use engagement. That's that. That's the one that people think of as buying likes and stuff like that. And it's it's not okay. So, um, page post engagement is designed to target people that are more likely to engage with and share your content. That's the same reason why we use this this goal type with content marketing. But it is amazing how often it is actually a better way to drive sales. Not always. Sometimes clicks to website or website conversions are actually better for that. But you have to test. But uh, in so many cases, we, we get absolutely amazing results with page post engagements ads, even as we start as we continue to scale up. If you hit the center of the bullseye uh, page po with page post engagement, you're going to find out that you can usually scale that up quite a bit uh, before it stops paying off for you. And one of the case studies that we left out, just because I, I really want to get a chance to maybe bring them in and actually sit with us and talk about some stuff, um, is uh, 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 some folks that actually launched an apparel brand last uh, last year on Facebook, and their first campaign literally blew their inventory out <laughs> to where they had to go buy more stuff uh, to to be able to run their campaigns again now. But uh, but they've been doing forty or fifty thousand dollars a month in sales, mostly through Facebook now, and uh, we've just started running shopping campaigns. So hopefully we'll get a chance to visit with them on a hangout uh, at some point uh, in the next few weeks here, but. This is the thing that I think is the most amazing with this campaign. It wasn't just that they made, uh, you know, obviously much more in sales than they spent on advertising because, well, that's what you're supposed to do. But 
Uh, when you look at the paid reach versus the organic reach, a week in, they had reached nearly 3,000 people uh, through paid advertising, but they'd actually reached more than 9,000 people organically. And that means people that shared, people that ended up on their Facebook page, but mostly from people sharing this post with their friends. That's cool. That, um, th and that is why we actually, I, I believe it was closer to $3,000 in, in the sales spike during the, the, during the time that this campaign was running. And so much of it is just we don't know where they came from because they show up as direct and there is no other way for us to track it. So um, where do those people really come from? Well, they didn't randomly type in the address of the site. They came from somewhere, and it's just one of those attribution problems that we can't tell where. But when you see you know, three times as many people saw this as what you paid for, where do you get that? You get that from the engagement ad campaigns and not from the website conversion and clicks to website campaigns. And so when you hit the center of the bullseye with a page post engagement campaign, it amplifies itself like crazy. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's always going to work out that way and that you're always going to hit the bullseye, but that's why we like to test with small audiences rather than large audiences. What we're really trying to do here is, is just skew the odds a little bit in our favor because if you look at... Um, Kind of just take take the whole custom lookalike audience that, that you would get if you uploaded your customer list or your prospect list that you have right now. This is how it's going to look when you look at where's the sales going to come from. It's going to come from tw the vast majority, right, is going to come from 20%. So what we're trying to do by adding things like demographic filters and behavioral filters and interest filters and things like that on top of it is we're trying to aim for the top 20% of the audience of, of, uh, of the group that you could target. And that means that you're going to get 80% of the sales for 20% of the spending. And in fact, it might be less than 20% of the spending because the people that are most likely to buy are also most likely to share and create this kind of organic result uh, that amplifies your paid traffic efforts. Ultimately, what we're trying to do with Facebook campaigns is start with people that are out there in the outer edges of the bullseye. The suspects, the people, well, you know, they're interested in pet grooming, but does that mean they want to be a groomer, that they are a groomer, or do they just like pictures of poodles with uh, uh, shaved into um, block shapes so they look like a Minecraft dog? You know, that's a thing, Leslie. They do that over in Japan. They, uh, they shave their poodles so that they look like pixels. Okay. Just, uh, just in case, uh, you know, you were thinking about switching to the dog grooming business, that'd be something you could think about. Um, but, but from that group of suspects, you'd like to find the people that are actually prospects, the kind of people that could be interested in what you have. Maybe they're in the market or thinking about getting in the market. And, of course, you bring those people closer and closer until some of them become buyers. And then the more buyers you get, the easier it is to identify better suspects that become more, more prospects. But the first thing you've got to do is test your way around to try and find the center of that bullseye. And... Unfortunately, we can only get so close right now. Depending on your market, it might be really easy to hit the center of the bullseye, and you might find it in, in, in your first try. Like yeah, We'll show you lots of case studies of people that hit it on their first try, um, and if we have time, we'll show you some case studies of people that uh, will hit it on their second or third or fourth or fifth try. Because there is no behavioral target on Facebook for people that want to buy your stuff right this minute. So we can target by interests, we can narrow down demographically, we can cheat a little bit with behavioral targets. But again, how close to what? Who is your best customer? Do you have more than one segment? Do you sell them more than one, what we call avatar, right? But who is your best customer? Who's the best, the best, the best, the best, the best customers that you have? What do they buy? What are they interested in? The more you can find out about those people, the more likely you are going to be uh, to be successful on, on Facebook. So I don't want to get too far into this, um, but to, to walk you through a quick example of, of how we do this, this process. So again, we're starting with suspects. We're boiling that down to prospects until we find you know, the buyers and the best buyers, and that's really who's at the center of the bullseye. Okay? And I'm going to go through a very, very simple example, just because it's a safe market for us to talk about, because we don't have anybody that we're working for in this market right now. But let's say that we wanted to get mortgage refinancing. 
and maybe we decided to start with uh, a native ad campaign, so a content marketing campaign, and that might be through Facebook or that might be through, um, gosh, any of these uh, Taboola or any of these other uh, native advertising networks where you can put sponsored posts up and other people's related post blocks on their blogs. And so let's just run an ad that says, will refinancing now save you money? And so it's going to be a news article. It's going to have interest rates. It's going to have examples of, of uh, people that might want to, people that don't want to. Well, gosh, if you just refinanced yesterday, you probably shouldn't do it again today because that will just add a bunch of fees. And a little bit of uh, topical targeting, and then bam, what do we want to do? We just want people that are interested in thinking about, will refinancing now save you money? get those people onto a web page. Now they can be in a much more tightly focused remarketing audience and so now they've be moved from suspect to prospect and then based on what actions they take on the page, so maybe they hit your ad that says get a free refinancing quote, maybe they're ready to go for the whole enchilada, maybe they're still thinking so they want to uh, use your little calculator tool that you've got there and and you'll have a 30 ounce audience for people that read the article but didn't interact. Well, in what order would you want to remarket to people, right? Well, you'd want to remarket to people in the order of first, the people that actually click the ad for a free quote. By the way, even if they didn't fill out your form, people that use the mortgage calculator. Again, even if they didn't complete the process, right, they're, they're still a good remarketing lead. And lastly, you'd want to you'd want to look at the people that read the article but didn't interact. And for those people, you probably want to show them more of the same. So more articles like this one, and not necessarily um, you know ads for the mortgage rate calculator. So this is what that looks like when you organize it into uh, segments of the audience. So the suspect, that person who uh, okay, they read the article but they didn't really take any action. I'm really not prepared to to call them a qualified prospect yet. So there's probably some money in my budget to keep talking to those people using page post engagement ads, but at some point they're going to expire from that audience and that's probably going to happen over the course of at most a, a, a month or two and, and probably not longer than that. The people that filled out the calculator, I might want to show them ads for the quote form um, or I might want to show them ads, uh, you know, I'll continue to show them ads for the quote form for a while, but after a while I'm probably going to let that expire too and I'm not going to call them a prospect anymore, although I might want to put them back into the, uh, into the suspects group and, and show them uh, more content uh, down the road because, again, um, if I haven't mentioned it before, running page post engagement ads with content that's interesting to people is actually very, very cheap and you get a huge organic echo when you do it. That's why we use that for our content marketing campaigns that we do for clients, and you know, we call that SEO uh, because of the SEO benefits of it, but it's really a content marketing campaign, which if you wanted to do this kind of stuff with it, it's very, very easy to influence the type of content that goes into that and what landing pages you drive people to, and so as a companion uh, to doing content marketing, uh, taking the people that have actually read the right kind of stories and running ads to them is something that's very, very easy to do. Or for the people that 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 uh, that filled out the quote form, of course. Well, guess what they're going to get? A quote, right? And and now they've gone from being a prospect to being an actual lead. And at some point, uh, they'll either be worth some money to somebody or not. Let's skip that. Let's skip all that. And let's talk about some other things that you can do because uh, a lot of folks out there um, don't have big customer lists uh, to upload. Um, or they're not retailers. But a lot of people are doing email marketing, and by the way, all the retailers who aren't doing email marketing, uh, shame on you, and all of the, uh, well, anybody, if you're not doing email marketing as part of your business, I think you're just leaving one of the legs off the tripod. And by the way, if you leave a leg off a tripod, it tips over. Um, email notification is something that's very, very easy to do with Facebook, and all you have to do is upload the list of people that you're going to send emails to to Facebook as a custom audience, and then show them ads on Facebook that are about the same thing that you're emailing about. So if I'm going to email a flash sale, or if I'm going to email um, about, um, oh gosh, a Google Hangout, I can run ads to you at the same time about that Hangout on Facebook and what am I going to get? I'm going to get better click-through rate on Facebook if from the people that have already seen the email, and I'm going to get better open rate on the email from the people that have already seen the Facebook ads. And oh, by the way, people will have seen both multiple times potentially, and you're going to get more action out of it. 
Um, we've seen um, measured lifts from doing this as low as 30% um, for what was pretty much just a straight up weekly um, here's what you should buy from us this week uh, email campaign that had very minimal effort into improving it. Um, a 30% lift from doing a little bit of amplification on Facebook to seeing more than a 200% lift <coughs> from somebody that uh, really took the time in, uh, into testing their email campaigns and into testing uh, the, uh, the offer uh, that followed that on Facebook. And that's for, for um, uh, a company that does flash sales a couple of times a month. They literally more than doubled uh, the sales uh, on their on their flash sale emails, uh, and we know that it was working, and we know that it was because of Facebook because they actually did the the, the test of not mailing everybody and or not promoting on Facebook every email that they've sent. Um, the tracking on this is tricky. You can do it, but it's something that you typically would want to do one time uh, or occasionally as a test to validate your belief that it's working. Um, but the only way to really run the test is to take some portion of your email list and not amplify those emails on Facebook, which means that you're, well, also not getting that lift from some portion of your list. So it's something you might want to do as a test early on, but it's uh, something that you probably <laughs> want to continue testing. So you really can't fully measure the lift. Um, it's just, uh, well, uh, we're lifted and we're, we're flying higher now and uh, we're going to continue this activity. And anytime you question whether it's worthwhile, it's very easy to set up the test and figure out how much uh, your email application campaign is getting for you. <clears throat> of course, we can also run remarketing and dynamic ads. Those are, um, depending on how, uh, how the rest of your business runs in retail or lead generation or whatever, you can actually find that it's very easy to set up, particularly for retailers, uh, dynamic remarketing. That means uh, that uh, you can run ads on, uh, on Google AdWords, uh, uh, display network, <laughs> You can run ads on Facebook and, and showing people the products that they were looking at or products within the category that they were looking at if they only got to a category on your site. Those kinds of things are very, very easy to set up. They tend to be fairly low volume in terms of spend and click through, but they're, it's one of the most no brainerest things that you can do. And really any channel that you get traffic from, no matter where you get traffic from, that can feed into Facebook and, uh, and, and you can run remarketing ads on, on Facebook, even if you don't do it through Facebook, even if you do it through an ad roll or a perfect audience. And by the way, sometimes ad roll or perfect audience can do a better job of remarketing your cold website visitors, the ones that weren't logged into Facebook, uh, than, uh, than, the, than, than Facebook can. And so um, there are right there for any business three no-brainer things that you should be doing. You should be doing remarketing. And you should be doing email application. You should be doing remarketing, not just from your Facebook ads, from but from every channel that you have, whether it's AdWords, whether it's SEO, whether it's email marketing, whether it's LinkedIn, uh, people telling their friends, and so on and so on. So I don't have a whole heck of a lot else to say about this this week, Leslie. As, as you know, this isn't something that we offer as kind of a canned flat rate service. It's something that we... Um, always want to talk to people about evaluate the opportunity and make sure that the opportunity for us to help is actually good for the person on the other side and not just good for us. Um, but if you're interested in talking to us about uh, helping you with your Facebook campaigns, um, I would love to talk to you about that. Now, if you're a retailer, I'm going to want to talk to you about AdWords because uh, if you're not running shopping campaigns, you should be. And if we're not running your shopping campaigns, we should be running them. And I'm going to want to talk to you about email, whether we're talking about email and uh, email application or if we're just talking about getting your email up and running, e email campaigns up and running for the holidays, um, well, we should definitely talk. And again, lead generators, um, we're happy to talk to. Those tend to be um, uh, an area where it's either a great fit and we can make a great difference for you or it's a bad fit. Uh, and so it tends to be kind of one or the other with lead generators where uh, most of the time for a retailer, it, it's, it's almost always going to make sense for us to, to help you. And if not, well, we'll be able to find somebody that probably can better than we do. Uh, but if you are a lead generator, I'm going to question your assumptions about um, the quality of the leads that you're getting. And I'm going to ask about the math. Because one of the things that is hardest for us in working with lead generators is that lead generators tend to uh, treat all leads as equally valuable. And that is the absolute uh, business-killing fallacy. Um, that will um, that will one day wreck you if you don't uh, get better at doing the math. And if you are ready to get better at doing the math and understand that uh, somebody that filled out your form after they searched for uh, 
instant mortgage quote because I need a mortgage right now and somebody who saw your ad on Facebook and happened to fill out that form um, you have to be able to do that math. So, do we have any questions that popped up, Leslie? There was uh, some interesting comments. I don't know if there's a really all, all that directing way of questions. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Michelle, have you been looking at these? Let's see. Look, Phil said this is my niche. Phil said this is my niche, having trouble finding buyers on Facebook also. Um, not sure why he's saying that exactly. I'm not sure which Phil this is. Uh, I think buyers are on Facebook. I think there's an attribution problem. Um, he could be talking about mortgage refinance. Uh, okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm read the website. Uh, Steve asked a question about um, about your slide, which I which I which I did answer. Although maybe you want to maybe you want to amplify on that. The uh, <clears throat> the business about uh, you know the organic amplification. You know, you're saying you know it, it does come about because of sharing, but how come that doesn't show up or or you know whatever? Right? I mean, so is it really a sharing count? Um, you know, it's not, not anywhere near that specific. You get um, there's actually the the little reporting that you can get into that 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 you can look at all the different actions that people took, um, but um, the organic um, number uh, for reach on 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 a particular page post, right? So um, if it's a if it's a dark post, then you then you're going to see a smaller amount of of organic because it didn't actually go through your Facebook page uh, visibly, other than the people that you paid to get it to. Uh, in this case, this is one that was uh, also targeted at their Facebook fans as part of the campaign, and also. Um, uh, um, uh, it was actually run through um, their their Facebook page, and so some of that is organic reach from their their fans. But understand that they had 900 fans <laughs> at the time that they ran this, and so it you know uh, let's knock off 900 from that number uh, and say that all the fans somehow saw it. Um, there, there's a lot more reach there just from sharing. So I'm not, I'm not sure what the question is, though. I mean, um, well, yeah, I mean, you were saying it's like well, that. That you know, you, you mentioned the, the the point that uh, when you when you pay, then the organic amplification is from sharing, but the shared count's not there. It's like, well, hang on, it's not it's not that. I don't I don't. It, it's not nearly that trackable, right? Yeah, it's just yeah, it's it's not tracked like that. Yeah, some, uh, close. Uh, how many people's news feed this become visible in um, is what the reach is. Right, indeed. Now, now, Kenny, in addition to baking a ham, actually did have a question. He says that qualifying offers are great. Is it is always a quote to win this, or do you have other examples? And this was the very beginning of the webinar where we were talking about qualifying offers. Yeah, and so well, all we're trying to do with with any whether it's qualifying content or qualifying offers, okay, all we're trying to do is figure out how to get people here, and so we're showing a whole bunch of people, uh, you know, a story about mortgage refinancing, right? Some of them were interested enough in that to move themselves a little bit closer to the center of their bullseye by clicking and reading that article. If we make an offer to give them a free rate quote, what does that do? That moves them all the way to the center of the bullseye, right? Um, it really, really, really depends, but mostly what you're trying to do is you're, is you're trying to get people to identify themselves as either the right kind of person or interested in the right kind of thing. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, if you, Let's uh, let's get an example of a, of a market, or maybe we could uh, do a whole show that's just nothing but examples of, of markets, and we'll figure out what the qualifying offers are. Well, I know some people. I mean, a couple of our customers do it. A couple of our clients do this. They use sweepstakes, and that's a, you know that's a giveaway in the same. Yeah, business. that's one that's one thing to do. I mean, you can also just use content. You know, white papers, uh, reports, ebooks, um, exactly. Lead items, free, free free training, free. buyers guides, reviews, uh, all kinds of stuff. Free giveaways don't work nearly as well as the person who's giving away the free thing thinks it's going to work. 
But depends on the yeah. fish. I mean, I, I would, I would, I would yeah. say yes and no. It depends on what the free thing. I mean, if you, if you if you sell widgets and you go to give away free widgets, it can work. However, I still I, I so I'm going to restate what I said exactly how I stated it before. Yeah. It doesn't work as well as the person who's giving it away thinks it's going to work. They think, oh, I'm going to give away a free widget and I'm going to get hundreds and thousands of people interested. It, it never happens that way. Well, I mean, the, the, I, know, of I know of one counterexample, but yeah, granted, most people have expectations of, in general about their marketing. I don't like, like, God Almighty, let's not even go into the expectations people have about SEO, for example. But yes, I will agree with you. However, that's that said, let's not let's not discount doing giveaways. It's just that the two kinds of giveaways, I think. Um, you should have very different expectations around, right? If, if your business is widgets and you do a sweepstakes, win a new widget, that's one kind of giveaway. You know, the other kind of giveaway is the one that leads up to that, where you're giving away something that's not the widget itself, but about the applications of widgets or how to use widgets or the difference of about you know what you should think about the ten ten questions you'd ask before buying a widget, right? Those are, I think in many respects, better sorts of quote-unquote giveaways because you do not diminish the value of the widget. Yeah, and by the way, it's, I mean, you know, if they, if they, <coughs> it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an easy, doesn't require much thinking to just give away product, right? Yeah. right. Um, and uh, if you can't think of anything else, okay, um, but make sure that that actually makes sense. Uh, you know, the, the biggest thing that I, I've seen all the time, and you, back in the, you know, way, way, way back in the day, you used to be able to um, you know, throw money into these banner ad uh, deals where, um, you know, you're, you, somebody can go to your website and, and they're automatically registered to, to you know, win $500. Okay, well, what does that do? That gets people to click the thing that want $500. Well, that's everybody, right? There's nothing qualifying about that, right? No, no, no. Um, I, I, we had a, a company giving away a Palm Pilot. Um, they sold Palm Pilot software. Hmm. Yeah. And, but you know, again, that's a case where maybe actually giving away a piece of software for free to get, um, you know, right, a mailing list of people that actually have Palm Pilots, you know, to the, the free trial of the light version of your software. It's, much easier, right? And so that was an, that you know that was an easy one to fix, where you know it did involve giving away product, but um, and creating a, a non-paid version of the product. But but um, you have to you, you, you have to think of this as there's a whole spectrum of options, and what you're really trying to do is identify people that are good candidates to show more you know aggressive ads and offers to, right? So sometimes it, it's you know I. If I if I've got a great video to sell my baby monitor that um, uh, you know will frighten people into coughing up a whole bunch of money immediately uh, as soon as they watch it, well, all I want to do is make sure that they actually have a baby that they care about, right? So um, a qualifying yeah, offer cool. might be something as simple as the 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 ten point checklist for making sure your baby isn't going to explode in its sleep. Right. Exactly. And that's and that's. You know that's about the lead item as approach as opposed to the the final item approach, right? Yeah, but um, again, this isn't like a you know, a sales funnel where they take one action then the next action, right? It's it's not a they watched your video, your teaser video, and then they gave you an email address and then they watched a longer video and a bunch more of them, and then they finally bought something or didn't. Um, qualifying offer simply means, you know, it can be a free download, okay? That they don't have to give you an email address for or anything, but. The, the fact that they went and to the bother of actually clicking to download your white paper about home security systems means that they're thinking about a home security system and now you can show them more aggressive offers. So it's not it's not the same thing in terms of talking about people as a lead when you talk about uh, advertising targeting because they are a lead potentially without you knowing their name. Well, yeah, but I don't think that's different, Dan. I mean, it's just a different about the, the the difference in the way we contact them. I mean, remarketing and exactly, it's it's functionally it's equivalent to having them on an email list, right? I can send them emails, or I can 
I can show them ads. What's the difference? It's just a different channel, and it's not like I was going to go look up their email address and get their name and personally talk to them anyway. And that, and to, you know, to, to, to Corey's point, indeed, you know, somehow we think that if people sign up for a giveaway, then somehow that means that they want our product. Well, maybe, maybe not. You know, one is that they could be unqualified because they don't have the money. Uh, one of our private clients, that's one of the things we're going back and forth about, for example, is what is this, you know, the, the people who's, oh, actually, a couple of them, are, if that's the case. It's like, what, what does this mean for the people who are in this contest or the sweepstakes as opposed to uh, the people who come in through other, you know, through other sorts of offers? The other thing that we end up with is, um, I mean, and this, is, this this deals with your whole lead qualification, you know, question about uh, for for lead generators, right? Uh, depending upon what that lead, you know, how do you score that lead? So what did, what did they sign up for? Was it a free giveaway? Was it a uh, you know some sort of contest to get something? Was it a lead item that indicates that they have an interest in that? Was it the fact that they show that they they demonstrated they really do have a baby, so that a baby monitor would make sense? Something that uh, Kenny points out in in, uh, in chat is like um, almost anything you do that's at least related to your product is better than giving away a Starbucks, you know, a gift card. Yeah, the Starbucks gift card is like the new stupid. It's the new stupid. And here's I, I got to tell this story. Like right? this is the ultimate, um, and this is an old stupid. One of one of the uh, affiliates back in the Stompernet launch. Okay. Okay, sure, it was a ten thousand dollar, twelve thousand dollar sale, something like that. But in <laughs> some, some Eastern Bloc country, will not tell his name. I don't even know if he's online anymore. But um, he was giving away ATVs. I, sorry. Well, so first of all, an all-terrain vehicle is pretty much as far away from the Stompernet offer as you could get. Um, and oh, by the way, it was you know, like FOB Romania or whatever the hell, and so it was exactly wasn't exactly free. It's so, like, okay, how do you get from sign up through my affiliate link and I'll send you an ATV, right? That just doesn't make any sense at all. It's the ultimately stupid, you know, Starbucks gift card approach. So that's not what you want to do, and, and it's. The other one we have, and we get this all the time with our e-commerce people, it's like, sign up for my email list so I can send you a coupon. Well, if that's the very first touch you have with a prospect, you know, it's a little bit early, you know, to be offering the engagement ring when we haven't even gone on a first date. Well, I, I wouldn't say that was an engagement ring. I think it was, well, never mind. I'll just... Yeah, it's just, I mean, it, it's, it, it just, it, you just, Big, big disconnect here. Big I have a cow, have some free milk. Yeah, I guess. So, I mean, those are, you know, and, you know, to Corey's point, I mean, most people seem to think that these things are going to be out of the park wins. And they're just not really thinking through. Um, on the other hand, a 10% coupon to get on their mailing list is better than join our mailing list, which is one of my favorite incentives for opting in. Right. Favorite one that's not going to work. Submit right. is just the call to action. Yeah, submit because everybody wants to submit. I submit to you. Yes, right. Resistance is futile. Um, so, uh, what was Kenny's original question? Oh, yeah. So other examples. So other examples other than just win free stuff. Well, think about where that person is in the buying cycle because it really is a funnel, right? Doesn't matter, right? Um, even if you can't get their email address, give them information. That's what content marketing is about. That's about touching people in the wide end of the funnel. You know, the more that those people engage with the message that you have, not a not a selling message, a message in terms of why this is an important topic for them. If it's not an important topic, they're not going to click on your stuff, right? If it is an important topic, they'll click on your stuff. If they do that once, then present it again. If they click on it again, obviously it's even, they've confirmed that it really is important, right? So it's about that engagement metric, and that's what, what is it, post, post engagement as opposed to conversion. That's why it's important to get that kind of interaction early. And so I, w I would stipulate that that's, um, 
you know, it's all funnel, even if it does, even if you don't have an email list, you know, you don't have a sequence of pages that they touched in order, right? The more they touch your stuff, <laughs> wow, that came out wrong. You know, the more they're interested in what what you have to offer. So, um, I would say look for the things which are not at the what you actually have to offer, but offer things which indicate that they will at some point be interested in what you have to offer. Well, there's a lot of offering here. So, um, we did actually get some questions on top of that. Well, let's see here. Which I'm trying to find now. We got a question from Mark that I don't think we answered. So if growing the email list is the goal, should we even attempt to get likes? Do they help in some way? Yeah. Uh, so yes, they help in some way. Um, but um, you don't have to attempt to get likes. Likes will happen as part of any campaign that you run on Facebook. Um, and um, <clears throat> there aren't a whole lot of cases where we run uh, like campaigns. But uh, there are times when the like button is the right call to action. And the time for that is what we call an onboarding campaign. So for example, if you've got an audience that you're regularly emailing to and you would like to get them onto your Facebook page and to like you there so that your cost of advertising to them goes down and you can get more organic distribution of your, you know, say, your email newsletter, then running like campaigns um, or running campaigns with the like page called action uh, on them actually do make sense uh, with that custom audience that you've uploaded. And they're, that's actually, uh, Facebook is still working on their marketing partners program, but that's actually one of the categories of marketing partners that they that they've identified as, as companies that, that, that focus on running onboarding campaigns. Seems like a really weird business to be in, but I guess um, we don't play in corporate world as much, and it sounds probably more impressive in corporate world. But uh, we've actually done a hangout on how to run, re, uh, run onboarding campaigns and remarketing campaigns, so it's in our YouTube channel there somewhere. Was, yeah, uh, um, ago, and, and Bob asked, uh, Bob, Bob ask, I've, I've talked to Bob about, uh, about his site, um, so it says, if I'm starting from scratch, um, should I just be focusing on using some offers to uh, get email list signups? And uh, by the way, that his particular business model is a, uh, it's kind of like a, what do we call it, kind of like a vertical equivalent of uh, Overstock or something like that. You know, so he's he, uh, he's presenting a bunch of uh, a, a bunch of of items. Yeah, I think really uh, uh, for for Bob, I think that the targeting looks a lot like what what we did with Paul and Gael Organic. Um, it's you know if you've got any customers now, that's a good starting place. Um, if you don't have any now, well, maybe we should be running some shopping campaigns to get you some customers. But um, it depends on your ability to keep up the data feed, but. Um, but that that if you have that as a starting point, um, I, I think there's some some obvious interest to lay on top of that, and probably some demographics that'll shake out from doing analysis of the customer data that you have. Because one of the things we we didn't talk about today, but um, we've talked about in, in Hangouts in the past, is I can't remember their new name. It's one of those companies like Upwork that changed their name from like to some. You know, Zybostics or whatever it is now, but uh, but it used to be called Rapleaf, and if you go to Rapleaf.com, it'll just redirect you to their abomination of a new brand name. But um, for with them, you can upload uh, you know an email list and uh, and get back matching records at a very low cost in terms of age, income, all kinds of different uh, different categories, and you only pay for the data that they actually have, and so it can be a very inexpensive way to analyze a, a small list. Uh, and figure out what what do I have here and who should I be targeting? Right, right. Uh, Steve asked us follow up question after thanking us for answering that one. So, uh, can we review the steps you take to define the target audience? So I don't know if you want to just bring up that old you know, the slide from your deck. I think you had one that actually covered the the steps. Well, it's. It, there isn't a slide that really covers that, and that's the the interest-based targeting is something that uh, we've uh, the the place to start is what we call the avatar exercise, and you know I believe we've got stuff online on that. Um, 
don't we uh, have a recent hangout on Avatar? Yeah. Or do we not? Yeah, in fact, I think that's even maybe even in instant classics on our homepage, if memory serves, but I'm not right. certain. You know, you know, Corey did the Facebook audience recon, which kind of touches on that um, very, very closely. But, um, you know, it's really, it's, it, it, it's a, there's an exercise first of figuring out who is that person I'm after, and then, uh, and then you can start to, to start to find interest. But honestly, it can be difficult um, when you have no customers whatsoever to start with. Right. If, if you're just trying to get started, you really have to you have to you know kind of target broadly and then and then use sort of relentlessly qualifying content to get the people that you want actually um, focused on your on your on your page and then start advertising around that. Um, but that's a very very long story that probably goes well beyond what we can answer in a quick quick Q and A. Yeah, there's one thing I wanted to follow up with you know concerning this whole. Um, this business of doing contests because I mean that there are, I mean as I know that people want to continue to do the contest because it's it's one of those things where they think well I already have a product so I just need to like come up with contest and and give some of that stuff away as, as opposed to what seems like hard work of of doing some sort of lead item and it's not really that the lead item is hard work so like thinking about what the lead item would contain appears to be the hard work and, you know and working with clients on this. And so, okay, fine. I still say, build a damn lead item. However, if you want to go build a contest, the in those cases, and I have to, you know, agree with Corey, it's a minority of cases where contests actually work, whether or not it worked as well as the, you know, the, the client wanted them to. But um, there are a couple of them that the contests work extraordinarily well, but it's only because of what I would call the consolation prize. You've got to think through, not, okay, well, I offered this and I got a whole bunch of people on my list. Great. So what? Do something with it. It's the follow-up marketing that makes it worthwhile. I mean, you know, like, so sometimes, you know, I mean, Karen's, you know, giveaway of uh, grooming, you know, a set of, like, super fancy grooming shears to people, that completely made sense because you'd find the people that were really interested in grooming, and that's exactly what she was trying to do. And uh, you know, giving them the option right there to you know complete their profile so that they can get jobs. Everybody that was qualified went right ahead and did that, and uh, it worked. You know, worked really easily. If I you know if I sell um, tennis shoes and I give away a pair of tennis shoes, well, uh, I got people that were interested in, in a free pair of tennis shoes. And so um, it might be something that you do after you've used qualifying content to identify the suspects, and then try to identify them as prospects. But even then, right, you're not going to necessarily sell a bunch of tennis shoes by giving away a pair. You have to do the follow-up marketing to sell the rest of them. Right, and, and it's, it's likely to be a bit different offer than what you're making, you know, uh, you know directly from the website, right? That's the point. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's where you've got you to think through, all right, so this is a person that maybe you've already touched before, maybe you haven't, uh, and they didn't take you up on your and your lead offer, right? They didn't actually, you know, whatever the standard offer is in the wild. Let's assume for the moment they didn't see it, uh, that they sorry that they did see it and didn't take it. Now, then they signed up for your contest. So now, what is going to cause them to become valuable to you? That is to say, give you money, you know, post contest, because that's the only purpose in the contest. Now, yeah, you, you have to think about the series of messages that's going to follow, not just. How do I get them here? Well, right. what, yeah, but that series of messages is predicated on the fact that it's a different person. That's my that's my point here. Is that that the person who signed up for the contest, and let's assume for the moment, you know, that they did not actually that they did see your original offer. If they saw your original offer and did not take you up on it, and they signed up for the contest, so now they're interested, but they're interested in something for free. Is is that even a valuable is that even a valuable lead? Certainly, you have to score it differently. And so, yes, is 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 the follow up important? Absolutely. And but what does that offer have to look like downstream of the contest to the to the runner ups, right? To the to the consolation prize, because only one person can win. I mean, the you know if you have a thousand people sign up, you can't give away a thousand pieces of product. That's not a business. That's just dumb. And so that's where this is to some extent. <laughs> It's actually harder 
than doing the lead item approach. You know, doing the lead item, you can figure out, all right, for the person who actually wants this thing, what can I talk to them about prior to selling it to them? All right, that's one cognitive process. A completely separate one is, here's a person who saw the offer, didn't take me up on it, but seems to want it for free. What can I give them that's going to make this work? Well, what can I do for them in the way I'm an offer that's going to push them over the edge that actually also makes me money? From my perspective, that's actually a harder problem to solve in many respects. But that's the one that somehow people gravitate to, and I don't get it. But uh, yes, does it have value? In, in, a, in a couple of cases, has has had very high value. On the other hand, in each of those cases, it had some tricks to figure out. It had some things to solve, problems to solve in terms of the messaging. Um, and oh, by the way, there's one where it worked really great. I mean, one of our private clients right now, we're working on this currently, is it worked really great. Now there's some changes about it, and we're trying to figure out, hey, is it going to still work? Not sure. That's so, test. I have the other thing uh, is... A couple, sorry, go ahead, Corey. Oh, you have other assets in your business besides just the product that don't necessarily make you direct money initially. Like Dan talked about uh, a few campaigns that were content marketing campaigns, um, doing the native campaigns, where once you have people that have hit your site or you have people that have given you an email address, you can now market to them your content, bare minimum, which will have them interact with that, like it, comment on it, share it, um, and also continue to come back to your site so they build that trust with you. So it's it doesn't have to just be the one and done aspect that uh, you either made the sale off the contest or you made you made the sale off the initial offer. Um, you can continue to build that relationship with them because you have their email or you have that remarketing cookie set, and then they'll spread that to their friends. Yep. Yeah, so I have seen a, a couple of cases where, um, with retailers, where giving away a product was exactly the right thing to do, but those tend to be um, sort of special cases. So um, we've we've seen it work for companies that sell um, uh, engagement rings, I think, or wedding bands. Or I, I can't remember which ones, which you put on your ring, you're married, then you can't take it off, so I forget about it. But... Um, but uh, they 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 were shipping a free ring sizer, mm. so all, all you had to do was fill out the form, and they would ship you um, a little plastic thingy to measure the the size of the finger, and um, and that was one that uh, I mean that was worth every penny it cost to send them out um, for free. But that's a, you know again a weird case. In other cases where you have uh, uh, you know some sometimes uh, you sell a lot of a lot of product and so setting out sample kits and stuff like that um, is something that works and we had a a b two b retailer uh, that had some good luck with that um, uh, in the past uh, sending out uh, sample kits of of their products and that's something that uh, you know I guess you get you can occasionally get some random clown order one that that it doesn't make sense but you don't actually have to ship the freaking thing to them. Mm -hmm. Um, we got a question here. Um, I think there there's a bunch of different questions in this, by the way. But uh, how do you address the use of this technique in a localized, and it means local, market of a million people? Oh, and of those, only 150k are suspects. So first of all, 150k of a million being suspects is is really high density of suspects. That's by by the way. But m moving on. So it's a local market of a million people. So I assume it's a local service business or something of that sort. Sort. And to say that there are 150k are suspects, I'm not sure how suspect is being graded here. Must be divorce lawyer. <laughs> Just kidding. Because we can assume that 10% of any city is getting divorced. <laughs> Just kidding. This That's, week, in fact. Yeah, could be. Could be. Uh, so I'm not I'm not sure what to do with all of the pieces of that of that question there. Um, well, I don't think there's enough information about what Gur is trying to accomplish here um, to answer this, other than to say it's you know you can target by location um, and delightfully even so down to radiuses now you can do radius targeting. 
Yeah. You can around the lo the actual address of the location you want to target. Well, that's interesting. That's very similar to what's been in AdWords for quite some time. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Very so nice. You can do city. You can do zip code. You can do specific address. Man, it's as good as geolocation ever is. <laughs> True. That's good. Wow, that is it's better the, than advertising to everyone in the world. By the way, the <laughs> other localized aspect you can do are uh, people that uh, live in that area. So live in either that radius or, or in that zip code um, or the zip code plus radius if you want to do that. You can do people that uh, live outside of it but were in it. So maybe they live on the other side of town but they were visiting. They passed through that area, that location. So if they were near your restaurant, you could put your address in for your restaurant and then say, hey, anybody within five miles, let's show them an ad or say one mile would be better, especially in L.A. And then the last one you can do is people that were in the location but live 100 miles or more away from that location. So people that are technically visiting. So if you were a restaurant or a theater or a bar or a gym and you wanted to have a specific offer to people that lived outside of the area, you could. That's Definitely. pretty awesome. That's an interesting thought. So that was the second one that you had to be lost on. So the people who were in the area. Yeah, yeah. So they don't necessarily live there. They were just in that area. So there's people that live there. There's people that were in the area. Uh, maybe they were shopping or something like that. And then there's people that live 100 miles or more away, but they were in the area. Well, okay, but yeah, I mean, because like, but my question was measured how, and so that would be people who were in the area and visited your website and show an address, some sort of permanent address, kind of. So how does how does that how does that work there? So oh, it's Facebook centric. So it's they know where they live, to a certain extent, and if they're if they're within that radius, then they'll show them the ad on Facebook. All right, so all right, so for example, if I if I run a business in Las Vegas, I could target people who are not native, who are on travel. Yeah. Yep. Huh. Provocative. Time yeah. to start that escort service, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you have to catch them before they show up at the airport, right? But still. Well, there's a Vegas hookup. Vegas and Tinder travel then. So start start your funnel with Vegas and Tinders. Yeah, right. Interesting. So um, we're kind of running uh, long here, guys. Yep, we I'm are, so let's wrap it up. Quick, but we did have a, a question from Phil uh, about whether we're just about enterprise clients or if we do small business. And Leslie, you can answer that. Yeah, I would have to say that you know the way I view enterprise is no, we are not enterprise right now at all. Um, we really only are, are are focused on the small business client, um, and so yes, I mean, depending upon, I, w I would say if your business is above about twenty million dollars, we may be able to help you, but that's not where our focus is. And it may involve training your team and helping you hire people, and not exactly running everything for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if anybody more. wants to get a hold of me, it's Dan at MarketersBrainTrust dot com. Um, you know, just. Send me an email. Let me know what uh, what you're trying to accomplish, where you're, you know, what your business is about, and uh, we'll uh, probably have a couple emails back and forth, uh, exchange some data, and then we'll talk. Right. And so I think that I mean that's that's kind of the end of the uh, the question discussion. So this, by the way, for those of you who are keeping track, uh, we're coming on fall. You know, kids are back in school. It's great for them. Hope that works out well. And um, the for those of you who are in e-commerce, by the way, you may actually notice that you know Q4 for most of you, for most people in e-commerce, is kind of where uh, you make or break the year. Um, yeah, there are certain things that you really ought to be doing right now, and if you're not doing, you ought to be doing them damn fast. And uh, with this particular hangout, we've sort of made the segue to those. Uh, what we call those, you know, quick hits, things you could do now, high priority items to, to do for the holidays. And one of those, uh, anyone who's involved in physical e-commerce needs to be running shopping ads and needs to be doing a damn fine job of it too. 
And so, Dan, uh, why don't you talk about what we're going to cover next week? So, well, next week we're actually going to um, start off with a little bit of a general purpose, a review of, uh, one, how the math works in paid search campaigns. So everybody understands that. That'll be, you know, quick five minutes or so. But um, but how the math works and how you, how you, what you need to be measuring to make it work. Two, um, some things that anybody can do if they have an AdWords account right now to go in and audit the state that it's in. And I don't care if you ran it yourself or if you're paying somebody else to run it. Um, it it's worth spending a few minutes to go through and make sure that it's actually set up and run right so that you don't discover that you're actually advertising to people all over the world even though you thought you were only advertising in the United States, for example, which most campaigns are set up so that it does exactly that. And uh, that's how you get Texans from Bangalore. Um, when you're trying to just advertise in Texas, guys. Uh, and and then we'll talk about the shopping campaigns in particular and, and kind of some numbers around what you can expect from that and what you need to have, uh, uh, what what's involved in actually getting it up and running. Because it, it, it can range anywhere from being super easy to, to something that actually takes us a couple of weeks of work to set up. Excellent. Excellent. And so, um, so that's that's next week, and then we've got some other th uh, some other events scheduled beyond that for the Tuesday Hangouts. Uh, also, I guess we should probably preview this. That We're not going to call it Tuesday Hangouts forever, baby. That's right, because we will be changing to Thursday, and that will give you good notice of that. I mean, it's not uh, not next week or the week after, but soon after that, we'll be changing to doing Thursdays rather than Tuesdays, and a lot of reasons for that. Which we can get into once we, you know, start talking about uh, kind of some of the content we'll be doing, so that we can give you better content. That is, in fact, true, and uh, we we'll, we'll need more more news on that later. Uh, but just uh, but just bear in mind, right now we've been doing Tuesdays, and we'll be moving to moving to Thursdays uh, sometime toward the end of this month. So look for that notification in your emails. Um, Okay, that's all I've got. And so, any any wrap up comments or questions from the group? Dan Find has Facebook nothing. ads, as they work very well. Yes, do Facebook <laughs> ads. Yes, thank you, Corey, for those of us. Uh, yes, yeah. uh, directions. Yes. <laughs> it's it's the comment. I love I love the comment. I think it's worth you saying it out loud. You know, campaigns that don't run un definitely underperform campaigns that do. Right. So. Well, it's not. I mean, they could actually both perform zero, so it's important to get sure. the conditions in there. It's like a, certainly a campaign that is not running will never underperform. Sorry, sorry, a campaign that is running will never underperform the one that is running. Trick, can you say that? But uh, so if you don't start, you certainly, yeah, you're not going to get yeah. it. But yeah, and it's okay if you run a campaign and it doesn't. I mean, if you get a zero, that's data, that's feedback. I mean, and from there, it's wonderful because you can only go up from there. No. And, and folks want to do one-off shot, uh, one shot, and you just you really can't on this stuff. You've got to get in and, and and take some action and test it. You don't have to waste lots and lots and lots of money doing it, but learn from it, apply that knowledge, and go back and try it again. And and pay attention to what you're doing. Pay attention to all the nuances of it because sometimes you run a boost or you run a, an ad and it just gets no coverage. Well, is it because you know? Is it because you're doing something that's really mobile centric, but you're running it on only desktop? You know, and so look at all the different nuances of it. Yeah, good deal. Right. Yeah, right. a series of tiny tests is way better than trying to do one big moonshot yep. because you won't hit the moon the first time. No, afraid not. All right, well, thanks a lot for uh, for showing up and, and hanging out with us, and uh, we will see you next week. And next week it will be Tuesday, and it will be. Uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Time at the point in time that you see us here live. And so thanks, everyone. Until then, keep on keeping on.